So we've been speaking about trials, and I think this will probably be the last session that we teach on trials and God's purposes for trials. And one of the things that I just wanted to mention tonight, and then I have a quick five-minute video at the end, a testimony that I wanted to share with you. But this aspect of compassion, how many of you, after you've gone through an ordeal, or maybe a physical trial, sickness in your body, injury, uh, some type of an emotional or relational distress, like your marriage or a child or a loved one, and you go through some tragedy or trial in those areas, it does soften your heart and it makes you much more sympathetic towards others. And you know, God will take us through those times. And yes, uh, one major part of that is for you, the individual, for you to learn how to cry out to God, for you to have faith to believe, for you to have endurance to wait upon Him and to wait upon His answer. And you store up treasures in heaven and you have uh, heavenly riches at His right hand that become known to you in those times. And so, yes, it is for you, but it's not all for you. It's that you can be a carrier of compassion. It's so that you can become a minister of mercy for someone else that God is going to bring across your path. And so this evening, one of the things we need to do first, what I want you to do, is think about a time in your life when you really suffered, when you were really going through it, and your heart was ripped in two. And I want you to think about one thing as we talk tonight. That time when your heart was ripped in two, that was so you could minister to someone else, so that you could sympathize with them. Having been down that path, you would be able to give them just the right words of encouragement so that they wouldn't give up and faint. And so think of that time in your life and realize God took me through that time for me to minister to someone else. And are you looking for that someone else? Because I want to tell you something, all of the pain and the anguish that you felt God will not waste. All of the pain and the anguish that you felt meant something. It counted for something. And God wants to use it so that someone else that crosses your path doesn't give up. Here in Hebrews, Hebrews talks a lot about the high priestly ministry of Jesus. And what the book of Hebrews brings out about the high priestly ministry of Jesus is quite fascinating. You all ready for this? Watch what it says here, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. He had to come and partake of flesh. He had to come and surrender all of the attributes of deity. He had to become and become just like a man and suffer just like a man and be tempted just like a man so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. So you take that in reverse, and the meaning of what's being spoken there is without Jesus having suffered as a man, he wouldn't have been the merciful and faithful high priest that he is today. He, had, he was deity. I mean, his, his character was perfect, flawless. He was truly sinless. But the one thing he lacked was the experience of suffering as a man. And so he had to be made like his brethren so that he might become that merciful high priest. Because as that high priest, it says that he is daily making intercession for you and me. He needed to know how to pray. And for him to know how to pray, he had to be touched with the same suffering and the feelings that we go through on a daily basis. Look at verse 18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted because he knows, he understands, he's been here, he's felt it. When you suffer, when you're tempted, when you're overcome, and then when you're overcome with guilt, or you're going through depression, or you're going through some mental illness, or you're going through some devastation in your life, 
or you have some choices to make to lay down your life in order to obey God, He knows what you're feeling. And He's there every step of the way. And He can uh, comfort you and equip you perfectly because He's been there. That's what these passages are saying. How much of our personal suffering is for the very purpose of ministering to another soul? And maybe it's just one other soul who will need our solace and our encouragement to not give up. Is that soul worth your suffering? Now think about that, because the rest of Christendom today, it's all about making you a better person, advancing you, letting you prosper. It's all about you. And here, you're beginning, we're going to begin to see a glimpse that when we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Christ, it's no longer about us. It's all about Jesus, and then it's all about others. When you surrender your life and become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you give up ownership of your life. You give up rights to your life. That's what denying yourself is all about. And most Christians today don't hear that message. They want four easy steps to make me a better person or to make me a more prosperous person. When you follow Jesus Christ, you no longer possess your own soul. You are a disciple and a servant of God. And if he takes you through a trial so that you can feel compassion for someone else and help them in their point of crisis... He sent his own son. He's just as willing to send you. Are you willing to be sent? Are you willing to suffer for the sake of someone else? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession because he's there for us. He's praying for us every hour of every day. He knows our suffering. He feels our pain. And he's there to meet us at our need. He says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. That word sympathize in the Greek is a very powerful word. It means to feel the same feeling of. So when you hurt, he feels that same pain. Think of that. When you're being tempted, do you understand that when you're being tempted with sin, he doesn't belittle you. He doesn't ridicule you. He doesn't say, what, what a bozo, man. You can't do anything right. You should be leaping over temptations in a single bound. What's wrong with you? Do you realize that's nowhere in Jesus' thoughts? He sympathizes with you. He understands. He's been there. He wants to help you. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin... Therefore, let us draw near with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can draw near in confidence. You know that you will not be turned away. You know that he will meet you at the point of your greatest need. It's not up to you to try harder or through self-discipline or self-will muscle your way through this thing. It's up to you to cry out to God and let him give you the strength because Jesus has been there. He knows and he will meet your need. You will find grace to help in the time of need and it's nothing you try to generate or manufacture in yourself. It comes from the very throne of God. As you turn your eyes in faith, and fix them upon Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm in over my head. Help me. And he will every time. He sympathizes. He knows. I put there in your notes. Unfortunately, this is true. Compassion only comes by suffering. We don't feel someone else's hurt until we felt it ourselves. We're, we're just that selfish. We are just that self-centered. And when we feel the pain, you know, if, if we didn't feel that pain, we would be tempted to look down on others. What's wrong? You must be doing something wrong if this is going so terribly in your life. And then when it starts to go terribly in your life, you understand. And you don't cast the first stone, but your heart breaks for that other person. 
I'm going to skip over Hebrews chapter 5 here. But again, as Jesus learned obedience from the things which he suffered, having been made perfect, it doesn't mean being made perfect in character. It means he was made the perfect high priest for you. He was perfected in that now he had the experience of suffering in the flesh of a man, of humanity. He knows now the limitations. He knows what it feels to be tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He knows what it's like to to wrestle against temptation to the point of sweating drops of blood. He understands what we're going through day in and day out here on earth. And because of that, he was made the perfect high priest through those things which he suffered. He learned obedience, and we can call out to him, and he hears us, and he comes to our aid. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I just want to focus on this for five minutes here. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of of all comfort, all comfort. There is not a pain, there is not a suffering that you feel that he can't comfort. You don't need to look anywhere else for your comfort. When you're all stressed out at the end of the day and your mind feels like it's going to explode by having multitasking on 20 different things all day, He's the God of all comfort. He can soothe. He knows how to soothe that stress. He comforts us in all our affliction. Not one thing is left out. You don't come up against a problem and he says, well, you've stumped me now. I don't know how to answer this one. He comforts us in all our affliction. You don't need that pill. You don't need that drink. You don't need that entertainment to let your mind go numb. Shut yourself off into his presence and let him comfort you. Learn how to be satisfied in him. Learn how to be comforted by his very present presence. He's able to comfort those who are in affliction with the, we, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. That word comfort there, the parakaleo, it means to call to one side, to console, to strengthen, to comfort, to encourage, to instruct, to speak. It means all of those things, but it's always with that undercurrent of encouraging and comfort and consoling. He comforts us in all of our affliction so that we will know how to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, so many today have grown up in screwed up families and dysfunctional families and they don't know what how to be a parent and they don't know how to love and so many people in our culture today don't even know how to have a relationship. But that's okay. He's a father to the fatherless. And you can learn from him how to love. And you can learn from him how to comfort. And as you in your prayer closet, you go deep into his presence and he begins to pour oil over the wounds in your heart and he begins to mend the broken heart you turn to someone else in need and you pass on that same encouragement and comfort to them we've all in this room we've all been through the valley of the shadow of death we know what it's like we know what a broken heart feels like We know what it's like to hit the wall and not be able to take one more thing. We know what it's like to be completely hopeless and helpless in a present situation. And we know what it's like when God reaches down and brings us grace and that beam of light, His presence in those times, and we are helped and restored and strengthened and hope is born again, renewed in our heart. And that's what you can be for someone else when you begin to comfort them with the same comfort that you received from the Lord. So I would encourage you to be looking. 
looking for that person that's going to cross your path that you need to comfort. Because God never wastes a trial. And he never wastes a tear. And he never wastes your suffering. You suffered so that you can minister to someone else and bring encouragement to them. Be looking for that person because they're coming. Because what you've been through is custom designed, tailor made by your heavenly father, and it's going to perfectly fit someone else's need that God will bring across your path. Look at verse six. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Remember, we were saying we don't live to ourselves anymore. We don't possess our own souls. We don't own our own life. We have surrendered all to Jesus, and we are his living sacrifices given to him for service. And what Paul is saying here is what happens to us is for the sake of other people. If we suffer, it's that we can comfort someone else. If we prosper and succeed, it's so that we can help and encourage someone else. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. So that's why you suffered, so that you can minister grace and mercy to someone else. There's other passages here, but you can look through your notes. I don't want to uh, go long tonight. But I did want to... Well, let me just mention this as I'm flipping through here. This whole thing, you know, Psalms 51, verses 10 through 13. It's in this psalm that David is confessing and repenting his sin of adultery and then murder to cover up the adultery. Heinous crimes both of them. And here, when David is at the lowest of his lows, he cries out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then you come down to verse 13, and he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. And that's who you need, teaching. Someone who's been to hell and back. Someone who has fallen that low, and then the grace of God has transformed and reborn them. You know, there's a lot of people today, and they've always said it through the years, that if a pastor fails morally, or if he fails through some other sin, that he should never be a pastor ever again. I say forget that nonsense. Now, if he's continuing on in his sin, that's a no-brainer, right? But if there's repentance, if there's transformation of heart and life, that's exactly who you want. You want someone who's been through it. You want someone who can tell you how to make it through, who can show you the way, who can, ex who can uh, be a, a rock of testimony of this is what God did in my life, and he can do the same for you, and you don't have to give up. And David here had sunk to the lowest of his lows, and he says, Lord, when you convert my heart, then I will teach transgressors your ways. And then remember what he told Peter? He said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but once you have turned again, do what? Strengthen your brothers. When you have fallen, you know what it's like, the shame, the humiliation. And you can help someone else who's fallen. God didn't author your sin, but he can use even your sin to minister to others as you minister to them the mercy and the redemption of God. 